My name is Jonathan Chuquette. I'm the lead biologist on the Ojibwe Prairie Reptile Recovery Program with Wildlife Preservation Canada. I'm also conducting my PhD part-time uh, with Laurentian University under the guise of the OPREC program. So OPREC is Ojibwe Prairie Reptile Recovery. I'm gonna use that, uh, that acronym a little bit tonight. And uh, I thank you all for coming tonight to, to listen to me speak about Massasauga recovery at Ojibwe Prairie. So I'll talk to you for between half hour and 45 minutes tonight. I'm going to give my talk in three parts. I'm gonna open up by giving you a little bit of a background on the Massasauga and on the OPREC program. And then I'm gonna jump into a review of some of the work we've done over the last five years. And then I'm gonna dip into uh, some of the PhD work that I'm working on as part of the OPREC program. So without further ado, let's get into part one, intro to Massasaugas and OPREC. So I know we're in the middle of a global pandemic, but let's not forget that we're also in the midst of a biodiversity crisis. Sparnowski et al. in 2011 asked the question, has the Earth's sixth mass extinction already arrived? And they basically say that there's an urgency to relieve the pressures that are pushing today's species towards extinction. And reptiles have not escaped this decline. And back in 2000, Gibbons et al. stated that reptile species are declining on a global scale. And we know that here in Canada, at least some of us know, it's not really a common fact that most of our reptiles are at risk. And actually reptiles are one of the most uh, endangered group of vertebrates uh, in our country. And that all trickles down to the local level. Here where I work in Essex County, we found just recently that the majority of reptiles and amphibians that occurred here historically are either gone, extirpated, extinct locally, or they are extremely rare. And one of those species is actually the Massasauga. Massasaugas are interesting in the fact that they are the only snake in Canada that's also not just endangered in Canada, but is, is a global conservation concern, meaning it's declining across its global range. And you can see the global map here of Massasaugas runs from, the range goes from central Ontario uh, all the way down to Southern Illinois, you can see all the counties where the animal has become extirpated in the red X. And there's Ojibwe Prairie right smack in the middle in Essex County. And the Ojibwe Prairie is unique because our population of Massasaugas here is the only one in Canada that lives in a tall grass prairie. You can see the beautiful landscape in the photo there by Russ Jones. We are isolated from the rest of our Canadian counterparts. The closest population you'll see in the map there is Wayne Fleet Bog, about 300 plus kilometers uh, to the east. And it's only one of two Carolinian populations left. We know of approximately 17 that were documented uh, historically. There's only two left, Ojibwe Prairie being one of those. It's actually more similar to its American counterparts across the river in Michigan and uh, genetically is, uh, is, the, is, is unique, it's actually more similar as well, not only in the prairie habitat, but also genetically to its American counterparts. And this, the one thing about the Ojibwe Prairie is it persists in an urbanizing landscape of West Windsor and the town of LaSalle. You can see in the map here, it's surrounded by development and roads, and that's really put a number of pressures on this population. A history of road mortality, of intentional killing by people and of residential development have resulted in, uh, in, in addition to a number of other threats, particularly urban um, related threats, have resulted in, in a history of decline here, precipitous decline since the 70s, 98%. These animals have really come to the point of, of blinking out and, uh, and they will um, become extirpated if we don't intervene essentially. And it's important that we do intervene because these animals have significance. They have cultural and community significance. They're protected by a number of laws going from the provincial all the way up, uh, sorry, going from the municipal all the way up to the, the, um, the national level. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they hold a unique component of uh, not only Canada's biodiversity, but of global biodiversity. And the thing here is that they, they, they persist in a globally rare habitat. So when we protect Massasaugas and we protect their habitat, we protect a very unique ecosystem, the tall grass prairie. And the Ojibwe prairie uh, is often cited as the largest protected tall grass prairie 
uh, in Ontario, one of the largest. So really important that we protect and recover this population. And so this is where Wildlife Preservation Canada comes in. So who are we? We're essentially a Canadian organization that focuses on saving animals that are facing extinction. And we do that really by specializing in captive breeding con and conservation translocation. So the, really the hands-on uh, techniques to bring populations back from the brink. We're based in Guelph. We've been operating since 1985. We do projects from coast to coast. And we also help to build Canada's conservation capacity, not only through collaboration, because collaboration is key in a number of our projects, uh, but also through helping to train young scientists. And I like to, to point out this quote. It kind of sums up what we do here. Conservation is more than preventing absence. It's also about creating presence. So let's talk a little bit about OPREC. And uh, what is OPREC? Well, essentially it's a program that's been administered by WPC since 2013. Uh, before I was employed by WPC, I um, was self-employed and I partnered with them to start this project uh, and to help secure funding through uh, Ontario and Canada government grants. This program is multifaceted in the, in the sense that we're targeting the Ojibwe population of Massasauga. That's our real goal is to recover uh, the Ojibwe Massasaugas, but we're also uh, designing our work and doing our work so that we can benefit a number of other species at risk, reptiles and plants that live in the tall grass prairie. So, and there's lots of different components to the recovery program, program which I'll get into. But what we're doing is we're, we're taking um, the recovery strategy, which is a federal government document, which recommends what needs to be done to recover the species. And we're, we're really taking the key points that um, are recommended for the Ojibwe prairie population and we're implementing those recommendations on the ground. So it's really targeted implementation of the recovery strategy. And that was released uh, draft in 2013 and we've been following that guidance ever since. I mentioned our major funding uh, and most basically half and half split. Most of our fundings come from the provincial government on one side and the federal government on the other side through some of their key endangered species and habitat uh, programs. Uh, and this is, I mean, we wouldn't have been able to do what we've done thus far without help from the provincial and federal government. So uh, a huge help to them. Uh, it's, uh, we've been fairly lucky to, to be funded um, most years uh, since we've started. So this has been, this has been great. The other important thing is that we've had a number of key partners, which has helped guide this recovery work. Since 2015, we put together a working group, the OPREC working group. And this is a volunteer group of stakeholders uh, and land managers that essentially comes together. Uh, we meet about four times a year uh, to advise on recovery and guide recovery projects, uh, as well as to develop implementation plans. So that's essentially a plan to implement the, um, the reintroduction and the recovery of, uh, of this population. And we come together under this, this umbrella or this vision uh, of a future where the Ojibwe population of Massasaugas is of a healthy viable size and distributed across a connected park system and where threats are abated and where human state conflict is properly managed. And you can see the key members of the working group are represented there in the, by their icons, by their logos. This recovery strategy is what I've been talking about. Uh, it guides recovery of not only, you know, the Ojibwe population, but Massasaugas in Canada. But recovery looks like a number of key things, everything from maintaining the habitat all the way down through augmenting the population through reintroduction. So it's these key um, um, these key recommendations that we are taking and building uh, into our recovery program. It's also important to note that our work is really focused in on what the federal government identified as critical habitat. You can see it circled in red here. And this critical habitat spans two municipalities, uh, Windsor and LaSalle. We have to work with a couple of different regulators to get permits to work on the lands in that uh, in, in, within the critical habitat. And there's four major property owners that we work with. So that's where most of our work is happening in that critical habitat. So now that we have a good understanding of the background of our target species and of the OPREC program, I will discuss um, our progress over the last five years and uh, give you a good sense of some of the different and diverse types of activities that we've been doing. First thing is population monitoring. So an important part of recovery is understanding your target species. And we invest over a thousand person hours every year, monitoring the population, 
assessing threats and surveilling the habitat. And this is all important because all this information helps guide the work that we do and helps us to manage adaptively and adjust what works and what doesn't work on the fly, essentially. Another important thing to, that we do is enhancing habitat and habitat becomes degraded. Uh, we have succession by shrubs. Uh, we have invasive species. And so a couple of important things that we do um, every year, actually, we enhance habitats within about 5.8 hectares. So in 5.8 hectare plots, we're enhancing habitats and we're doing that through the building of woody debris structures like what you see here. We've built over 150 of these brush piles and log piles to help Massasaugas. And we also have been removing over 775 kilograms of invasive plants to help promote the tall grass prairie habitat and the endangered plants that live therein. And through our monitoring, we've actually been able to determine that those woody debris features that were are quite uh, effective. Uh, Massasaugas give birth to live young. Males will choose uh, like a log pile like this and will gestate there until she gives birth to live young. And we've identified, uh, we've observed an average of 11 uh, observations of species at risk snakes using our woody debris features every year. So every year we've had uh, Massasaugas or fox snakes using these features. And in four of the last five years, we've had one or two gravid females using our enhancement structures and even some babies born at them. So um, really effective, something that we're gonna continue to perfect and to do uh, or in the coming years. Now, this is unfortunate. Uh, many of you see dead animals on the road. This is a fox snake and this is a, um, a snapping turtle. And, and row mortality, it exists in this landscape. It's a threat to, to our species at risk. And so we want to know where it's happening and what it's affecting and how often it's happening. And so for the, over the last five years, we've actually recorded over 5,500 road-killed vertebrates on roads that bisect uh, the Ojibwe Prairie Complex. And we use this data to identify hotspots where are the animals getting killed in greater numbers and where can we put up fencing like this to keep them off the road so we've installed an average of 287 meters of barrier fencing every year since 2015 most of that's this temporary black stuff that we put up uh during the active season we take down at the end of the year but we've actually started getting into some permanent fencing you'll see in the bottom right here where we put up uh, 260 meters of permanent snake mesh to keep uh, rattlesnakes out of uh, residential backyards, keep people safe, keep snakes safe. And we're gonna, we're moving more into this permanent stuff. We've actually just installed 300 meters this year to keep uh, snakes off the road. Habitat protection is really important. And in terms of uh, habitat protection, one of the, the key things that we do is awareness of the importance of habitat and submission of, of records to provincial databases. So for the first part, in 2016, we partnered with Lakehead to actually identify um, the Ojibwe Prairie Complex and Greater Park Ecosystem seen here. And then we nominated it to uh, the King Herpetological Society um, and, and to hopefully get it designated as an important amphibian and reptile area. And we were successful in 2016. It was, I think, the 11th in parasite in Canada. This is similar to the important bird areas. It doesn't give legal protection, but it essentially helps identify the most important areas in Canada for our reptiles and amphibians. So we got a lot of media attention here and it was, it was great. And this is basically the landscape and the designation that we, we work with uh, moving forward. And then we're always working with partners to try to increase habitat protection within this landscape. And we also, within that area, uh, we submit our endangered species observations. And that's an important part of habitat protection because the province doesn't have the, the observation data they can't protect the habitat. So we've submitted over 1,800 species at risk observations uh, in the last five years. That's species at risk reptiles and species at risk plants that you can see in the right. Really important that we submit those observations because if we don't know that the animals are there, then the habitat really can't be protected. So that's a key part of habitat protection. I also mentioned that the Ojibwe Prairie Complex is fragmented. So it's the main parks that we have protected under protection are subdivided from each other by roads, by residential areas. And so one of the things that we've been doing is to try to identify corridors. Uh, and, and here's a map here of a five kilometer long, 17 hectare wildlife corridor that uh, links habitat. And we've been working, this is a, um, a right of way. This is a, a utility right of way. And so we've been working with Infrastructure Ontario and Hydro One to allow us uh, to manage uh, habitat for tall grass prairie. And our main goal here is to create a five kilometer long 
um, tall grass prairie corridor that goes right through the spine of the Ojibwe prairie complex. So we're working on different components, uh, making brush piles in here, working with partners to install eco passages where the corridor intersects roads. This is basically guiding us in how we uh, move forward with our partners to connect these habitats. We're working in an urban landscape. We're working with the venomous species. We need public buy-in to recover Massasoit. There's no doubt about that. And so public outreach is a key component of what we do. Uh, and that includes things like installing signs. We have, uh, we've installed 15 public outreach signs in the last five years, everything from interpretive signs seen here with the mayor of the South to driver awareness signs at road mortality hotspots uh, to Massasauga information signs in the park. So people know, you know, not to just pick up any snakes willy nilly so they don't get bit. And we work with um, homeowners uh, and park users who use the parks and who live around the, the parks and the critical habitat parks. And we've, been, we've delivered over 2000 outreach materials to residents. We've also done questionnaires so that we can better understand if our outreach is working. And, uh, and we're using that information to help better fine tune the messaging uh, that we're delivering to people. But we have a pretty good sense of the support for recovery and it's quite high. It's highest right around the provincial park. Um, so that's really good to know for moving forward with reintroductions. Another part of public outreach is giving talks like this one, sharing information about the recovery work, sharing information about Massasaugas, the importance of the tall grass prairie. Uh, we've given 19 public presentations about since uh, 2015. Um, we like to get our, our, our work in the media. We've been featured in uh, over 15 media stories, mostly local media, but some provincial a little bit national and two of the, our official languages. So that's really important too, to get the word out there. And I don't wanna forget about population augmentation because the population that we're working with is so small that it will not be recovered. It will not persist unless we restock the population with new animals. We do have a captive population spread across a number of zoos, Toronto Zoo, Detroit Zoo have Massasaugas and they manage them as one and trade amongst each other. However, there aren't enough animals in the captive zoo to produce young to for reintroductions. So we've been working with a bunch of different partners. You see a list up here. Some of them are still working with us, some of them aren't, to try to find out how we can increase the captive population size. And we've been working um, since 2015 on this. We actually just got some great, uh, some great progress this year. We got the permits in place and through partnerships. So we have 14 new snakes collected from healthy populations up in, in central Ontario to add to that captive population. Our target was 30, we're already halfway there. So that's, that's some, some great news. So that's uh, a quick uh, rundown of some of the work that we've done in the last five years. And now we're going to move into the, my PhD research, which is happening under the umbrella of the OPREC program. And the main topic of my research is reintroduction biology. So reintroduction biology is the study and practice of trying to establish populations using translocations. So translocations are the movement of an animal or group of animals from one place to another for the purpose, in this case, of conservation, for the purpose of reestablishing populations. The problem is we really, for a number of different animals, we don't know how to make translocations work. We don't really know how to establish new populations. And, and snakes, I mean, particularly for snakes, there's a lot of unanswered questions. We still don't know when is a site good enough? When do we address all the threats to reestablish a population? Um, all the way to, you know, like when, when um, how do we overcome the challenge of overwinter survival? Uh, in temperate zone snakes. There's a number of questions that have been put forth uh, in 2009. And even more recently in 2014, when it comes to translocations of herptofauna, which are reptiles and amphibians, uh, we're still dealing with how to make the techniques better. Germano et al said, technique improvement is a dominant theme. Uh, captive husbandry and release techniques, all the way through to evaluating appropriate methods. We're still trying to figure these things out to make translocations work. And, Habitat quality is still one of the greatest reasons for translocation failure. But we have our federal Massasauga recovery strategy, uh, which essentially suggests or dictates or guides that we figure out if translocations are effective to manage populations in Massasaugas. Um, we should determine the feasibility of augmenting populations 
uh, using translocations to increase population size or distribution. So this is the, the guidance that we're given and the language that we have in order to move forward with determining if translocations will work for Massasaugus, which brings us into my PhD, which is about improving not only captive breeding, but conservation translocation techniques to recover temperate zone rattlesnake, the Massasauga. So I'm conducting this PhD work part-time uh, at Laurentian University, and uh, my advisor is Dr. Jackie Litzkis, and I'm being co-advised by Dr. Trevor Pitcher uh, down here in Windsor at the University of Windsor. And uh, Renu Zoo is an important funder of this work, and this is an NSERC program that links conservation practitioners like myself with zoos to really help foster conservation work in zoos. So I'm going to go over the five chapters of my PhD, all of which are related to Massasauga recovery. I'm gonna skim over the two last ones, but I'll go on a bit more detail the first three ones because we've actually collected some data and I can talk to you a little bit about some preliminary results. So the first chapter is all about reviewing correlates of translocation success with snakes. So what works and what doesn't work for snake translocations. And this is important because we're going to talk about this document. You're going to see this document a lot here. This is the guidelines for reintroductions and other conservation translocations that's put forward by the IUCN. The IUCN is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So they basically say that we need to figure out the most appropriate life stages for translocations before we do them. Uh, we need to figure out the correlates between pre-release behavior and post-release survival. So, you know, what is it about raising animals in captivity that results in whether they, they live or die once you release them? And they acknowledge that low survival once you release an animal, it can be due to a wide range of factors. So there's, um, I mean, we need to figure out a number of things here that are consistent with the, the, the research questions that remain for snakes. Uh, and we do have some guidelines, because I, I, I point out here a number of review papers um, that have been published that talk about what works and what doesn't work for reptiles and amphibians in general. Uh, and this gives us some good guidelines, no doubt. However, snake translocation projects specifically have only ever made, out, made up a small percentage of papers reviewed in these studies from 4% of 33% of projects included in these studies. So we really don't have some snake specific uh, guidelines and there hasn't been a review out there specific to snakes. And when it comes to Massasaugas, which is our target species, we do have some guidelines, or some guidance rather, from a handful of Massasauga translocations that have been conducted. And we do know that um, generally the animals seem to have a, a fairly normal survival rate in the active season. It's winter time that really kills them off. And this paper here shows a study that was done at the Ojibwe Prairie back in 2006. And, uh, and 27 snakes were released by uh, Karen Cedar, who works at the Ojibwe Nature Center. And Andrew Lentini is an author here. He's at the Toronto Zoo. And unfortunately, uh, none of those animals survived the winter. So there, there's still some, some real unknowns in how to make these translocations work for Massasauga. So I want to find out what works and what doesn't work for translocations, which techniques are associated with survival of snakes, both in the short term uh, and then long term, and when it comes to uh, population establishment, for example. And to do this, um, I want to do a systematic and non-systematic review of the literature. And uh, not only the, public, the published literature, but also the other unpublished literature out there uh, that talks about snake translocations. And so thus far, we've assembled uh, 109 unique sources, so published papers, book chapters, etc., that talk about a translocation that was done and also present some results. And these information sources represent 118 different case studies um, spanning 41 different species. So we have a lot of information now. Now the next step is to analyze this information and, and look at which factors are associated with success and which aren't. And actually the three species, the photos on the bottom here, the Massasauga, the timber rattlesnake, and the common water snake, uh, these, are the, these actually make up 30% of all of those case studies. So these species are quite commonly translocated and quite commonly um, published on. So uh, we'll get some good information on those species as well. And ideally in the end, the significance of this chapter is to really synthesize the snake translocation research and, and provide guidance on the most likely factors to influence success 
uh, and, and hopefully improve uh, reintroductions of snakes in the future. And this is just a diagram of showing what I, the, what the results will look like in terms of the factors on the y-axis and, uh, and essentially the results on the, um, on the x-axis here that would uh, give us an image of which factors are more associated with uh, successful translocations and which are not. And then we move into chapter two. Uh, which is all about evaluating appropriate monitoring methods. Back to this IUCN guidelines. They recommend that we collect baseline information before conducting a translocation. Makes sense, right? I mean, if we don't know uh, much about the population that we're trying to reintroduce, um, I mean, it's really difficult to ascribe uh, the changes um, that we observe uh, with the actual impact of our releases, particularly when there's still animals alive on the landscape. The problem with snakes is that they're really hard to find and rattlesnakes are really hard to find. And, uh, and so, you know, we're dealing with trying to estimate the range, the distribution of a cryptic animal, really hard to find animal. And so occupancy modeling has become more and more popular as a way to do that because it incorporates the fact, uh, what's called imperfect detection, meaning that every time you go and survey for the animal, you don't find it. And so it builds that into the analysis. And you look at DP here, DP means detection probability. And so detect, when detection probability is less than one, that means that um, you're not finding it every time. One meaning you find the animal every time you go, with mastosaugus, that's not the case. You have to survey many, many times before you find the animal. And so this analysis, I want to use this to evaluate population establishment of massasaugas and determine whether or not this is a useful approach to evaluating uh, our um, reintroductions in the future. Uh, but there's some caveats here. And the thing is, is that with any modeling, there's some basic assumptions that we need to respect. And if our detection probability is too low, so DP less than 0.5, basically we have unreliable results. So in those cases, it might not be a, a useful approach. And, um, you know, finding a snake out in the wild is difficult in and of itself, but it's also the likelihood of finding a snake is influenced by a number of factors. Uh, whether the species is highly abundant, uh, what season it is. So it's really important that we, we determine, you know, we standardize how we're searching for this animal uh, because that will affect detection probability. So essentially what I want to do in this chapter is to estimate detection probability and occupancy, occupancy being the range of massasaugas at the Ojibwe Prairie before we even do any translocation. So really understand the state of the population and, um, and the likelihood or which techniques will respect model assumptions for occupancy modeling and maximize that detection probability. So all this work um, has been done. We conducted a number of repeated surveys, standardized surveys using published protocols and testing out different methods. We looked at spring versus summer surveys, single surveys versus team surveys, and two different methods. You'll see this VE is visual encounter, and that's just looking out in the habitat for the animals. Um, ACO is artificial cover object, and that's putting down uh, wood boards or tins and looking for snakes underneath. And, uh, and then we analyzed this data using uh, an occupancy modeling program called Presence. So we have six years of data, uh, over 3,800 or approximately 3,800 person hours of surveys for these animals out of Ojibwe Prairie. We have over 220 unique observations at only four sites out of our 40 though. So the range isn't very big, but uh, we started doing some analysis with this data. And unfortunately, the ACOs, the cover objects were not successful, a successful method at finding massasaugas. They were successful at finding five other uh, snake species, but not a useful approach for surveying for massasaugas. Uh, visual encounter surveys, on the other hand, are effective, but we have low detection probability. So you can see detection probability in the y-axis ranging from zero to 0 0.6. Uh, and then you can see the year of, of study in the bottom axis right here. And uh, although we do, you can see the first year we had a pretty high, relatively high detection probability. But by the way, 0.3 or 0.4 means every four surveys out of 10, we find the animal, okay? So here, unfortunately, uh, when we have high detection probabilities, generally because you have a pregnant female being seen day in, day out at the same spot, because they tend to hang around at one spot and that artificially inflates detection probability, that's not good. We can't really, uh, that's not, it violates our model assumptions. 
but group surveys in the spring are the most promising. Uh, and so this is where we have uh, the most, this is basically where we need to, to, to guide our monitoring methods in the future in order to use this method to evaluate our translocations. So hopefully these results will uh, not only give us baseline data pre-translocation, will also help us to improve techniques to evaluate translocations for Massasaugas. Uh, and, and the results here have really pointed out the importance of trialing different methods before you do your translocation. So you can really be confident in how you're going to measure success. Which brings me to chapter three. Again, before we do any translocations and because habitat is so important, we need to select and validate where we're gonna release the animals. And again, Germano et al, we saw this already. They said that habitat quality or lack of specific habitat characteristics are one of the greatest reasons for translocation failure. The greatest reason, that's for herptofauna. And the IUCN here in their guidelines also point out that it's essential to evaluate the current suitability of habitat in any proposed destination area. So I'm listening, I'm not gonna ignore all that advice. Uh, in addition, I'm cognizant of the previous uh, reintroduction attempt that happened in 2016, where none of the release, not, sorry, 2006, where none of the released massasaugas were alive following the winter. Uh, and these authors, they state specifically that repatriation is a synonym for reintroductions. So reintroductions will only be successful if snakes are released in close proximity to their hibernation sites. That's because they found that the animals would actually come back to the, to the near the area where they were released to try to find a hibernation site. So the idea is that we should release them where there's good hibernation habitat under the assumption that they will come back to try to hibernate there. So I wanted to evaluate, first identify, and then evaluate suitable release sites for massasaugas based on hibernation habitat quality. And essentially, I want to know what the overwinter survival rate of snakes artificially hibernated at those sites are. And through the help of, specifically through the help of a colleague, Annie Yagi at Wayne Fleet Bog, I identified four one hectare grids in the middle of the nature reserve. You can see them in the box there. They've been outfitted with groundwater wells and frost tubes. And that, those have been monitored since 2015 so we could figure out the space underground called the life zone. Where does it remain frost free below the frost line, but above the water table for the whole winter so that any animals in there hibernating underground would survive. So I use that information to identify release sites, four release sites within uh, those one hectare grids that you see in that red square. And then, this is pretty cool. And then at those release sites, we installed 10 of these artificial hibernacula. So these were designed to mimic crayfish photos, which are the natural uh, hibernacula used uh, by Massasaugas. And with some advice from again, Ann Yagi and some colleagues in Hungary, uh, I designed this artificial hibernacula and uh, we installed them. And then last year, we intentionally hibernated 21 Eastern garter snakes. You can see those guys in the picture down there. And you can see the hibernacula when it's installed next to the garter snakes, that's what it looks like. It's installed in the ground. So we hibernated 21 Eastern garter snakes. Now that was just this last winter. And, uh, and I'm happy to say that everything went super good. The air temperature in these uh, hibernacula was quite stable. The humidity levels were high, which is what we're looking for. You can see some pictures of the snakes in the tubes and we evaluated them through a boroscope every two weeks. And in the spring of this year, almost all of those snakes survived. We had only one snake die over the wintertime, which is really promising and suggests that the, the method we use to identify uh, hibernation sites and, and ergo release sites is actually pretty good. So we're gonna study these sites for a second year uh, to increase confidence in our results. And then we're gonna go from there. But Essentially, this study will help support a rigorous release site selection method and ideally help myself and other practitioners to overcome that significant barrier to translocations, which is the overwinter survival. There's a, a nice article put, in, put out by Canadian Geographic in June of this year uh, that, out, that talks a little bit about uh, this research. So if you guys are interested, you can go and check that out on Canadian Geographic's website. Finally, I'm gonna briefly talk to you about chapter four and five uh, more or less together, these are the captive breeding side of things. So in chapter four, 
I want to help improve captive breeding protocols for Massasauga. And then in chapter five, I want to help develop a sustainable harvest um, and release strategy. I'm going to, so I'll give you a brief outline of those. So I talked to you about the fact that there is a captive population of Massasaugas and it's managed by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Now in these two documents, the AZA here state that we need research into the environmental and physiological requirements for inducing reproductive behavior in Massasauga. So essentially we need to find ways um, to increase reproduction of these animals in captivity. And in this other document, they go out to say that we want to develop standard reproductive protocols. Okay, so those are, those are basically what's put out there as important for the captive population in Massasaugas. So what I want to do in chapter four is I want to figure out which conditions in the zoos have resulted in greater reproductive success. And then I want to use that information to help develop or recommend rather standard reproductive protocols. Uh, and I'm going to do this by collecting, analyzing data from about 27 captive adult female Massasaugas uh, that are known right now in the captive population. And the importance of this is that ideally it would contribute to uh, the recommendations would contribute to increasing the number of captive bred animals that would be available to do translocations at not only Ojibwe Prairie, but elsewhere across the range of uh, this species. Now talking about chapter five, I'm pointing to that uh, reintroduction guidelines again. And essentially uh, the IUCN state that modeling should be used to predict the outcome of a translocation under various scenarios as a valuable insight for selecting the optimal strategy. And then Knessa et al. in this paper down here state that releases deplete the captive population and can reduce its viability, generating a trade-off between the insurance and reintroduction objectives. So in other words, we need to figure out how to, like how many animals to release every year and for how many years. And if we're harvesting from a captive population, we need to know how many animals can be harvested from that captive population and still sustain that population. So some important questions when we're planning uh, a reintroduction. So what I wanna do is use this thing called PVA, population viability analysis. And it's a, it's a modeling approach to compare competing reintroduction scenarios affecting wild and captive populations. Okay, so essentially I would assemble demographic data like uh, birth and death rates and age of maturity from the wild population. So that's from the Ojibwe population or nearby populations. And with demographic, I also want to assemble demographic information from the captive zoo populations and then analyze that in this program called Vortex. And Vortex is a program that does PVAs. And ideally, the outcome here, the significance here is to provide annual release targets that would help establish a wild population while sustaining a captive wild source, right? So essentially it would help us understand given the growth rate in the captive population and, the, and their target population size in the wild, how many animals can we take from the captive population every year and keep building it and build the wild population? So it's, it's quite complex. So that's why this kind of analysis would be very helpful. So let's bring it all home. Conclusions. So, what did we hear today? Well, we heard that Massasaugas are globally imperiled and, and the only snake in Canada that's of global conservation concern. And it's in decline. It's in decline across its range and it's really in decline at the Ojibwe Prairie. Uh, it, this population needs hands-on recovery techniques or it's gone is essentially uh, the point here. And so the OPREC program, the Ojibwe Prairie Reptile Recovery Program has really been implementing uh, the recovery strategy since 2013. We've had some successes in habitat enhancement and, and mitigating threats and, and building partnerships, et cetera, but there's still more work to do to prepare that landscape and to get ready for uh, successful translocations. And then we, we heard about the PhD uh, research that's going on, and this is important because we know that we need to improve conservation translocation techniques for temperate zone snakes. And that's what the PhD will aim to do to try to get some better techniques out there that not only we can use, but that other practitioners can use. Because it, when it comes down to it, effective reintroduction techniques are really a key component of biodiversity preservation. So I, I wanna make sure that uh, I thank the, the major funders and the supporters uh, that have been helping us uh, develop OPREC and helping us to uh, recover 
uh, this population of Massasaugas. And I thank you all for listening and uh, I'm happy to answer whatever questions that you have. Thank you very much.